May God fill you all with great hope and joy and peace in your believing. Amen. The message today for our Reformation Festival is from John's Gospel, chapter 8, where Jesus talks about when the Son sets you free, you are free indeed. In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Reformation Day, which is actually tomorrow, Halloween, is the 505th anniversary where Brother Martin Luther attached his list of 95 theses, their statements of concerns for actual discussion and debate under the church door in Wittenberg, Germany. And really, that was what he was looking for. Debate, discussion, hopefully a meeting of the minds, certainly not the upheaval that produced such a piece of paper. Realizing that the church's marketing scheme of selling God's forgiveness by indulgences was wrong. And that all of us are already forgiven. Totally accepted by God with the gift of faith in Jesus. That is the heart of the gospel. And that beautiful heart of the gospel. That beautiful treasure of Christ. That ideal stood as a threat to the power structures the church leaders had in those days. And truly wished Martin dead. Now many of us sitting here today probably would think like myself, oh, with doing that, then what did Luther expect from the church leaders but only a pushback and more? But such handling of leadership that we might think of naive in the Middle Ages certainly is not the same as we find politics now. All of us in one way or another have been burned by decades of deception and mass media exposures But in the 16th century, religion sat at the top of the triangle of a well-arranged hierarchy of church, empire, and household. It was illegal not to be a Christian. The Jews were given some leeway, but were pushed into their respective ghettos. Many outspoken Christians wound up dead for questioning just a few doctrines. Compare that to today. Church attendance and faith loyalty is on an all-time low and has been for now at least 50 years. A recent Canadian census, which would have been in 2015, revealed that the growing number of nuns, that's non-religion, was at that time 22%. Pre-COVID was 30%. I don't know what it would be now. I publicly confessed my baptismal faith by confirmation on this day 36 years ago. And I think two others out of my class are still active in some form of church life. Most of the people myself and my family know don't go to church. They're not anti-church or anti-faith, they're just uninformed. Back in the early 2000s when I pastored in Edmonton, there were kids in the church neighborhood who after school loved skateboarding. We had a handicapped access ramp out of concrete, made a wonderful ramp to jet off of. One day I left a few beverages out there for them to drink. And then there was a knock on the door. They had to use the bathroom. So I let them tour the church building to get to it. And all but one had never even been inside a church before. They pointed to everything, asking, oh yeah, that's an altar, a cross, a picture of Jesus. And they talked and listened and asked a billion questions. And then one of them came back. A year later, we had an outdoor church service. It was September, still warm in Edmonton that year, and uh, sort of was a welcoming to the community. And one came back. So we see people are still looking, but they don't know what to look for and really who to trust. We wouldn't want to return to the Middle Ages either, where making attendance compulsory and mandate believing were all the same way in lockstep form. Perhaps within the dying of loyalties from the past is something for us to consider as an actual opportunity for real growth, the rising of a church that is centered in the gospel of Jesus Christ. Because Martin Luther himself viewed the church as that, ever and always reforming, changing, transforming. And that happens in John's gospel as Jesus talks about continuing in his word, literally abiding, living, breathing, having life in his word. Now, living is not boring, it's not stagnant. Living is the, not the same old, same old, or at least it shouldn't be. Not when living is in Christ. 
We become one with him in his word. That's what the living in that word does. We, they can't then tell the difference between us and Christ's word. We are both one and the same. And that can take many forms. It can be simply just reading your Bible. It may be the word you heard from a lifelong uh, journey in the faith pops up every now and then in your memory. It may take the form of evidence of how you live your life day to day. And that shows that the word is working in you. Living in Jesus is really a relationship faith bond. When we live in relationship with people, we listen, we respond, we have life together. So too with our Lord. Prayer life is communication, very simply. And Jesus promises amazing results as well. You show yourself to be a disciple. Now, that name disciple, I know it should make us feel really good, but not full of pride. For disciples, never a boss, never an expert, a follower, and a learner. An image of human growth within the body of Christ on earth. So by living in Jesus, living in his word, being his follower, we grow into knowing the truth. And we know then what Jesus knows. And it's not a huge undertaking to understand what that is. The truth of Jesus Christ and him, his life, his death, his resurrection, that sets you free. Now, freedom is a whole other topic and even has gotten tons of attention in the last few years in our culture Freedom is often misunderstood now as it was even in Martin Luther's day. And Jesus' audience of believing Jews at that time, they're not expecting to wrestle with some new idea of truth or freedom. In the Hebrew culture, freedom came through God's immediate deliverance from trouble, whether it was through the muscle of a king or the ability to live without threat of slavery as when Egypt and Babylon were overcome. Now, the Greek and Roman world, they viewed freedom as having a knowledge of what one can and cannot control. So Jesus enters into all that, and he brings in a brand new era of freedom. And the only way anyone can be free and arrive at their true self is the surrender of one's will and power to a loving external kingdom, and that is in Jesus Christ. That truth is at the heart of the crowd's arrogant response that they somehow think they didn't have any slavery before. And we too tend to like freedom as long as we're not reminded of what we were free from. While those that day may assume Jesus was talking about Egypt or Babylon or Greece or even the Romans that ruled them at that time, slavery to sin, that captivity is his concern. That's the root of every single problem. And it's not always an easy concept to grasp. Sin isn't just about the bad things we do that show. Sin is a state of being, a condition into which we're all born into and trapped and cannot get out of ourselves. We are slaves of it in that we can't change it. Our will is only to serve the sin in whatever form it takes. And we can't even change our own course and return to God. Human sin brews in us an insecurity that we're never good enough, that we're not worthy of love, And we simply will never have enough or be enough. So we try to elevate ourselves our own ways. And it's always at the expense of others. Whether it's dimming the light of others so that yours shines brighter. Downplay what others do or don't do so you look better. But it never makes any of our bulbs shine brighter. This is what causes us to do things and think things that hurt others. Jesus frees you and me from all that. We don't have to live that way. We are all a valued treasure in Jesus Christ because the sin is the only thing that stands in the way between us and a life with God forever. We have to be made right. We can't get it. It has to be given like that pumpkin, you know, illustration we had today. God intervenes. He removes all that stuff from our lives. And it's not just a one-time deal. It's a returning to that every single day of our lives that the Garbage is removed and the beauty is there and the light of Christ shines. Because we are meant to have that light in ourselves. Because the justification that we love so much at this season and this festival, it really just means it's as if we've never sinned. God sees us no longer as a sinner, but he sees us as Jesus. Because Jesus cures sin's dreaded disease. And now Satan is powerless. He can't harm you. Death will be the last doorway to pass through, and that goes through Jesus too. Because the Lord has set you free. 
That crucifixion deflates all the pride, all the anger, the insecurity, all the loss, all the arrogance. That rough wooden cross just rubs Satan the wrong way, and his fate is sealed. Now Jesus' blood, that cleanses you, and it also chains the devil to hell. But that's not even all. Jesus hasn't just freed you from something. He has freed you for something, to be a true disciple. And that involves simply loving God and loving your neighbor as yourself. That is the simple gospel truth. It doesn't have to be complex. It doesn't need a whole list of doctrines. It is that simple. That is living in the word. And that's how freedom ought to be viewed. Not to just do as we please or push back for just the sake of rebelling. Because we are each other's keeper. We are salt. We are light. We are witnesses. We are truth sayers, peacemakers in the world. And we are to see the world as Jesus sees it. A world that is in need of love and life and light. We are free because God is 100% always in control. His love and forgiveness does not depend on us one bit. Grace is simply that, a gift. And so, if salvation is all God's doing, which we agree is, and it is free as we would agree, and that God covers us with forgiveness, grace, and love, then does it really matter what we do? And of course, the answer is yes. We are Jesus' feet and hands and mouth and eyes and ears in the everyday world. The baptism gift we have of faith calls us and guides us through the Holy Spirit. Our discipling is never done in this life. We continue living, growing, abiding in that word, in that life. And how you live and what you accomplish is holy and right because of whom God has called you to be. You are brothers and sisters of Christ. Sealed with the Holy Spirit, freed by Christ from all that stands in your way, and freed for living a life as his follower. Serving God and serving neighbor. And well, Jesus invites you all to continue. It's a constant, it's moving, it's active, it's living, it is never done. Living in that word and you are always free. And that is good news. God's love is so complete, so all-encompassing, so unlimited, that he forgives and forgets everything even what we cannot. God's love ultimately defines who we are. And the only one who knows us completely is him, chosen to call us his dear children. That is what defines us. That is what frees us. God's love is there, and he loves us as we are. He doesn't always keep us that way. We continue growing, living in that grace and that repentance and that renewal and that new life. But in God's eyes, in the end of the day, we are enough. Jesus' cross is enough to get you through. The flesh and blood and the bread and wine of communion, that meal is enough. And it not only satisfies the faith, but gives us more strength to continue onward. And we are free from all that harms us. From the past, from fear, from regrets, from mistakes. Free from it all, whether it seems possible or not. Set free for others in Jesus for another 505 years. Amen. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. And now may the peace of God, which goes beyond our human understanding, guard your hearts and lives in the one true faith in Jesus Christ, now and always.